I'm pleased to welcome Greg Pascarelli back to Hastings Hall. Greg was the, and to Yale indeed, uh, Greg was the inaugural Lewis Icahn Visiting Assistant Professor in spring 2004, and he returned to Yale in 2006 as Aero Saarinen Visiting Professor. Tonight he will deliver the Miriam Belazug Memorial Lecture at the request of James Andrichuk, Christos Bolos, Avi Foreman, and Marcus Addison Hooks, editors of Perspective 47, Money. All of them a class of two, uh, 2012. And I'm happy that, to note that James, Avi, and Marcus are here. Christos has walked off the reservation. <laughs> He's in Utah. Where is that? <laughs> The Belazug Lecture Series was established in 1999, honoring a 1991 graduate of the school who was killed in 1996 when TWA's Flight 800 mysteriously crashed shortly after taking off from New York en route to Paris. It's now believed that that plane was the first victim of a terrorist bombing, um, although they're not 100% certain. Miriam was then editing what would have been Perspective 70, 30, rather. She was flying to Paris as part of her work in the office of the architect Peter Marino, who very generously endowed uh, uh, significantly to help this series get started as a, as a memorial, offering the editors of the most recent Perspective an opportunity to invite a contributor to their issue to deliver a public lecture on an original topic. Greg Pas Pascarelli is the 17th Belazug lecturer um, and in the series, and that began with a talk by Mark Wigley. Michael Hayes, Kenneth Frampton, Felicity Scott, Neil Denari, and Sam Jacob are among those who have also been Belazug lecturers. The most recent Belazug lecturer was Sean Kelly, Keller. Uh, assistant Professor of Architectural History at the Illinois Institute of Technology. I first encountered Greg Pascarelli when he was a student at Columbia in the early 1990s, where he arrived after receiving a Bachelor of Science from the College of Commerce and Finance at Villanova University. From our first encounter, I realized that Greg was a force to be reckoned with, a young talent with a profound sense of himself and <laughs> and of new possibilities in architecture, not only in its relationship to craft, but also to commerce. After receiving his Master of Architecture degree from Columbia in 1994, Greg worked in the office of Greg Lynn Form before co-founding the firm Shop, Sharples, Holden, Pascarelli in 1997. Shop quickly established itself as a leader among the new generation of architects garnering a number of important commissions, including the Atlantic Yards Project in Brooklyn, and with projects in China, Kenya, Great Britain, and throughout the United States. Their pencil-thin skyscraper ap apartment tower, now on cons in construction on West 57th Street, which I believe we'll get a glimpse and an explanation of, um, promises to be a notable new marker on the Manhattan skyline. In the year since, uh, uh, since its founding, <clears throat> shop has grown to 100 person, 180 person, but I think I'm wrong. What's? You're off by 50, because that was three months ago. Three, three months ago, 230, what, what, you know. It's like, it's like gaming theory in Las Vegas. <laughs> 230 person practice located in Lower Manhattan, where their offices have the privilege of overlooking the construction of one of my buildings. Yes. <laughs> The firm's work has been exhibited widely throughout the United States, Asia, South America, and Europe, as well as in the 200, 2004, 2006, and 2014 Venice Biennale uh, art uh, exhibits in the uh, 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 <clears throat> and, and exhibits at the Venice Biennale. Shop was selected as an emerging voice by the Architectural League of New York in 2001. 
In 2002, Wired Magazine gave the firm the Rave Award in Architecture, a citation that celebrates innovation and the individuals transforming commerce and culture. <clears throat> the November 2002 issue of the magazine AD, Architecture and Design, um, titled Versioning Evolutionary Techniques in Architecture, was guest edited by Shop. In 2014, Shop Architects was named the most innovative architecture firm in the world by Fast Company Magazine and the Firm of the Year by the New York State Chapter of the American Institute of Architects. Please join me in welcoming Greg Pascarelli back to Yale as he delivers the lecture, Design Risk, Design Reward. Greg. Thank you, Bob. Um, it's great to be here, and um, I really appreciate the kind words. And uh, I do also remember our first encounter at Columbia, and you were very generous in the way you described um, <laughs> how full of myself I was. <laughs> so, um, it's wonderful to see so many old friends here tonight. It, it, this, I did teach, I think, four times at Yale under Dean Stern's tenure. And every time it's been a fantastic experience. Uh, this is a really special school. And um, it always just feels good to come into this building. There's no question about it. Um, you know, many thanks to the faculty who are here tonight. It's great to see so many of you. And uh, to the editors of Perspective 47, and most of all the students who came out tonight. So thank you very much. Um, tonight I'll deliver a talk that is long overdue, but not easy to give. Yes, I will show the work of our office shop and some of the projects that are both familiar and not yet seen to try and illustrate our efforts. But there will be several parts of this lecture that I have never discussed in public before, partially because I was raised not to discuss these things, partially, and, and I was educated not to discuss these things, but we as a profession must discuss the central catalyst for most decisions about designing and making our world money and risk. So SHOP was formed as a, um, as a firm that was really about a kind of think tank that would ask questions and that we would ask questions of each other. And at SHOP, we talk about money and risk not in the sense of accumulation or desire. We talk about it in the sense that one must be fluent in this language if one wants to have an impact on how most decisions are made. SHOP was formed as a collaborative practice where questions of all kinds are asked on a daily basis whether or not they are cool or not. When Bob asked me to give the talk, I started to think about the partnership at SHOP, the seven partners and 200 designers. We thought about the number seven in a few different ways. We started to think that seven, as partners, is a number that keeps having recurring themes, both in architecture and in outside of architecture. <laughs> um, and we started to think about that idea about what does seven mean, what are the things that you could do, the lists of seven go on and on and on. But the way we wanted to frame the lecture tonight was about what we're calling the seven rules. Tonight's lecture will be about the rules that our brilliant professors and our mentors and our leaders have taught us and how we broke them all. <laughs> so there are seven rules that I'm going to talk about that were things that were just absolutely canonical in the way that they were spoken to us about things that you could and couldn't do to succeed. And we didn't try to break them, but it just kind of happened. And so I wanted to frame tonight's lecture about risk and money according to those seven rules. So the first one, and actually, Bob, I think you and Peter were the two who told me, you said, don't have more than two partners, at least with their names in the, in the, in the name of Not the firm. Not me. <laughs> oh, right, you said only one. I forgot. <laughs> So, you know, I think that a new generation of practice thrives on the notion that our lives and our firms are intricate ecologies, robust in some regard and fragile in others, much like the world we are attempting, attempting to elucidate and improve. And so we have seven, par seven partners at SHOP. And I think that the most important thing is not that there's just seven of us, but that the seven of us all came to architecture from other backgrounds first. And that we were always kind of free to adopt other means of problem solving from other industries and try to bring them into the world of design. 
I think that such offices represent affiliations across multiple partners with little but a vague understanding of where the work of one individual begins and the other ends. Ironically, the architectural blob that once held hope as a third way beyond the modern versus postmodern dichotomy has unpredictably morphed. The blob now has sparked renewed optimism, not necessarily as an architectural form, but rather as the organization chart for new modes of practice that may provide a way out of the corporate versus celebrity trap. Across the new firms, uh, one sees common approaches, but not signatures, in the work each may do for institutions or developers, for private wealth, or for public purpose. While clients and budgets may vary, a core credo we recite among ourselves binds us together. It's the complexity, stupid. Let's get together and try and solve the problems. This is a map that I think came out about three years ago, which was the first map that tried to completely draw the universe. Now, we know it's obviously as wrong as a flat uh, Earth version of the world at some point. But it's just an interesting thing that, that there's such an ability right now to look at, use technology to look at data and to look at the complexities of what are, what's happening in the world and be able to see them in a way that we've never been able to see them before. The, the new millennium has exposed us to a level of complexity heretofore invisible to humanity. Errors past may have been equally intricate, but rarely did we see the intricacy so clearly, much less revel in it. Indeed, how many of us could foresee the overwhelming complexities with which we are in, inundated today? Be it the internet, big data, climate change, fluid sexual and racial identity, the human genome pro project, late capitalism, global pandemics, terrorism, or rapid worldwide urbanization. We may simply want to nail down our era, but we are, have arrived at an era that is simply too big to nail. This is a map that shows, um, I think it's all the Twitter feed, the Twitter postings in um, six different cities around the world in a particular night. Bob, notice the, uh, the Upper East Side is very dark over here. <laughs> so. So. As it should be. <laughs> Such shared, such shared conviction may well be the death knell of the lone genius so revered since the Enlightenment as an anachronism. And this is a map. This is the, the latest drawing of the internet. I, I find what's interesting. I think blue is, is what's the computer downloads that are coming from North America. Red is Europe. I think green is Asia. And white are the unknown. Nobody knows where they come from. And what we are right now is in a moment where we no longer need Superman, but we need the Avengers. We need the ability to have multiple talented people come together for like purpose to try and solve these incredibly complex problems. And so, I mean, I think our office has always been about this from day one. It was about something that was shared. And, and although, as Bob pointed out before, the name shop did originally come from names of the partners, Sharp was Hold and Pasquarelli, we actually took our names off in the second year of our existence and changed it just to SHOP. Um, and it was really because we knew right away that we wanted to practice in a different way, where it wasn't about one particular person or name, but it was about this kind of group collective where we could challenge each other and challenge the way that architecture gets built. So rule number two, don't build in your own city, at least not until you're good enough that you can get away with it up close. I believe that it was Frank Lloyd Wright that first stated that and said that it's really important to do it as far away as you possibly can. <laughs> um, you know, but while shop does have work around the globe, and these are locations of some of our projects, um, we are definitely New York centric um, and have a lot of work going on in the city. And while it's really exciting to travel and to look, look, take methods of problem solving to different countries and to think about how you might uh, solve those localized problems, there's something very different about working in your hometown. And it's something that we love and we revel in and that we're incredibly proud to be called New York architects. So this is um, a, pic a drawing that was recently done of what the New York skyline will look like in less than 10 years. Um, so the building that Bob was talking about that we're working on is, uh, is the Steinway Tower right here. I think that's yours. Is that a version. A version, a version. <laughs> and we all know that's yours and about 20 others. Um, 
And um, you know, and the, the, it's it's amazing because we are we are in a moment, I believe, that is going to be written about just in the same way the 20s and 30s was written about. We are at a moment where New York is transforming itself and doing it, I think, in wonderful, magical ways. This started more than a decade ago. Probably the catalyst was 9/11 in some in some respects. But this idea of the city and people living in dense urban environments and the sustainable strategies that that offers. And, and the investment in design of public space to keep quality of life high has really fueled um, um, the growth in, in New York. Um, you know, that building is announced, but there are three other towers SHOP is working on that are all over 1,200 feet tall. Um, one in, in downtown Brooklyn, which will be the tallest building in Brooklyn, one in lower Manhattan, and another one in Midtown. And so while, while it's, um, it's tough to have to work out your problems and your mistakes when you're a young architect on home turf. I also think there's an incredible advantage to it as well. So if Alberti said that mathematics was the common ground between art and science, we believe that those three together are what create sort of are, are, are the, the, the catalyst for good design. But that there's something else besides design that, that one has to, as an architect, really embrace at multiple levels and test out through your work. And so if local is this, if building in your home city and building locally is the rule that we broke, I think that the way that we were able to break it was by heavily involving ourselves in the politics around space and, and uh, the way in which buildings get built and approved. So I think the first time that we did that successfully was with the East River Waterfront Project which was an international competition that we won to do both a master plan and then a second competition to actually design the esplanade that we also won. And quickly, this is, this is the map in master planning and then the map in schematic design of all the different agencies in New York that one would have to deal with to get a publicly funded, federally funded and locally funded project through two community boards, seven neighborhoods over 10 years. And to be able to be the master of, the, of the, the sort of coordination between all of these elements really enabled the architecture to, uh, to, to get a lot more architecture approved and to build something that was more robust and something that actually has connected with the local communities over time. And now as we embark on far more controversial projects in these same neighborhoods, we actually have the backing of the, of the public in this area because they knew that we came through uh, the first time. So the way that we started this was to think about this esplanade as one element of three parks surrounding a harbor. We looked at the conditions. <clears throat> Here you had garbage and truck parking, places where there were up to 14 layers of fence between where people lived and the waterfront, beautiful 18th century squares used as parking lots, and the way in which we started to think about this project was to look at all the different neighborhoods. And the problem was it was very difficult to make what we called the cross-grain connection from where people lived out onto this waterfront to use that open space. We did a survey of all the waterfront typologies of New York to see what worked and didn't work on each one. We found the places that were most similar to the location that we were working. And we started to think about the conditions that we saw, from a, a street that was actually functioning at Water Street to a service street, uh, Pearl, to basically a highway and parking uh, uh, lot area between the FDR and South Street, to layers of fences, to sheds on piers blocking people from access to open space. And so we made an argument to the city, get rid of the parking, add as many trees as you can wherever you could find soil that opened up to the, to the sky, get the bike lane in, and while we did try to take down the FDR drive in the same way the Embarcadero was taken down, we didn't have an earthquake to assist us. Uh, we got a lot of pushback from, from the banks in lower Manhattan, and so we had to build a park with an elevated highway going through it. So we made the argument, instead of complaining about this big object above us, let's think of it as a free roof and start to insert different programmatic elements underneath underneath the highway and, and use these as ways to sort of activate the waterfront. And then the other idea, so here you see the activated pavilions, the FDR exists, we uh, uh, narrowed the width of South Street so that you could cross it, 
And then we argued that you should try to make uh, uh, both passive and active recreation on the piers. And so the final design allowed for that. We, we embedded the lighting inside the drive itself so that you wouldn't have big spotlights. Wherever we were on decks, we used precast concrete uh, uh, elements that had also lighting buried inside them that allowed us to mound up the soil enough that we could get trees. Uh, we tried to put as many planters in different locations uh, near the waterfront and then had other places where the steps went right down into the water. And just by sort of executing these planters, dog runs, seating areas, pavilions along what will eventually be a 1.8 mile stretch of Esplanade, it started to radically transform the neighborhood in a very positive way. And so the first phase was finished about three years ago. We're currently working on phase two is under construction, phase three is also under construction. And it was very simple. We convinced the city of New York to allow us to paint the girder of the FDR Drive lavender. That took two years. <laughs> and um, you have these, uh, what we call the get downs that allow you to go down and basically even touch the water. The plantings, there are lights in the, um, in the um, uh, railing system that shine out onto the water and a series of furniture elements. And um, the other thing that was really tough to get approved was we believe that you should have bar seating at all waterfronts because, <laughs> because if, you sit at a, if you sit in a standard chair and you look out to the water, the 42 inch rail is exactly where your eye wants to see the horizon. But yet if you could make the railing become wider and narrower where it necessarily needed to be, you could get these stools up high. When you sit there, you could have lunch, you could read the paper, and you really get this fantastic view. So you could see, this is almost exactly where that truck and garbage pile was in the first scene. This is now a year after the plantings have gone in. Here are some of the get down elements where you can go closer to the water. Looking out from under the drive towards Brooklyn and, uh, and walking along uh, the Esplanade at night. I have to say the, the, the lavender light is remarkably romantic. I guarantee you make out with whoever you go down there with whenever you go. <laughs> Um, this is the first uh, pavilion that finished. This will be a restaurant. Um, there's going to be a series of up to 13 of these along the two miles. Some will have community facilities, some recreational facilities, and some, um, some facilities that will generate revenue, such as this one. It's about to be open. And then what has been the most special part that we've, we, we've got to rebuild Pier 15, which had been taken down, but they kept the permits open, and we're currently under construction on Pier 35. And so when we got there, Pier 15, as I said, the, the permits were still open so we could rebuild it. Um, but uh, we knew we were able to do that. But really, we, we were so desperate for open space, we wanted to try and double the size of the pier. Now, there are environmental reasons why people don't want you to shade more of the river bottom. Um, plus, if you start to build the pier that wide, your biggest expense in the pier is the piles going uh, into, the, into the riverbed. So our idea was to make a double-decker pier and to use the, the sort of revenue-producing um, um, program to become green-roofed uh, uh, supports of the upper level of the deck. Now, the problem was, aren't you just recreating the problem of the FDR drive with this big thing over your head? So we said, well, if you could make the belly of the upper level so beautiful, um, therefore, you kind of get two for one, two square feet of open space for every foot of river that you're, you're shading, and you eventually end up with a pier that really works, where you have active maritime uses below, revenue producing pavilions here, and then passive recreation on the top, and all made to sort of feel a little bit magical by having this sort of supple red roofed um, um, underbelly. So here you can see the glass pavilions that come right up through with their green roofs that become lawns to sit on. There are planted elements. There's amphitheater seating looking at the historic ships to the, to the north. Um, here you can see it on a typical day. The, it's, it's really very well used. And then the feeling of being under it uh, at night. And so this was, again, the first phase as it got completed. Very interesting because we worked with, with the public agencies to get this built. But meanwhile, right in the middle of the site was the South Street Seaport, which was under lease to originally the Rouse Corporation, then General Growth Properties, and finally now the Howard Hughes Corporation. 
who then came to us and asked, well, what would you do with this 1983 building? So, which some of you may remember. And for those of you who've been down to New York recently, that's all gone right now. Um, and so we said, look, there were a lot of reasons why that building was designed the way it was 30 years ago, but I don't think today we would do an interior-oriented shopping complex on a waterfront that didn't really connect to its, its surroundings. So we said, if you were gonna build something out there, it really needs to feel like streets and, and alleyways and places that you could move through and that opened up the views instantaneously to the piers of the Brooklyn Bridge. And at the same time, we felt that the actual grid of the city needed to come out, that Beekman Street and Fulton Street needed to come out to make a real block. We wanted to get the esplanade through the neighborhood, which wasn't possible at the time, and proposed then putting pavilions and uh, the historic tin building would be located here. And then all of the FAR from the entire site would be loaded onto one site um, to pay for the whole uh, project. And so there is this kind of scale, uh, smaller scale of retail that we wanted to bring out here. We didn't want this to be big box or typical shopping that you could find anywhere else. We wanted to connect the parks through the Esplanade, these series of different parks, so it almost makes a little bit of an emerald necklace in the neighborhood. And looking at the existing uh, site plan with the proposed site plan um, that's currently going through the Euler process today. And so one of the problems is that the tin building is actually tucked under the FDR drive, but we've got to raise it five feet to get it out of the floodplain. Um, the existing Pier 17 building has been removed. The tin building will be taken down and cataloged. The entire deck will be raised five feet out of the 100-year floodplain. When it's rebuilt, it will be set back about 30 feet to allow the esplanade to go through. The larger floor plates of Pier 17 float above and are sort of uh, wrapped in a highly articulated um, channel glass facade. Um, it's a flat roof, which will then be planted with a garden, so it gives a 60,000 foot public open space to the neighborhood. And then a series of retail pavilions and buildings float underneath to make a series of streets like a neighborhood um, with double loaded retail on every single part of the, of the complex as it moves out into the water. And so this was the existing. There's the big change to the flat roof here. And that's been approved. And now we're working on this next portion uh, or phase of the work. And one of the things we really looked at the morphology of the piers in New York uh, with these large scale glass pier doors that can drop up and down so it can block the, the wind as it comes up. And you've got a series of different elements where the water comes into the building, the building goes out to the water, and you have these streets. And these are some before and after shots of what it looks like now with the pavilions and a lighting system underneath and at night. This is what you see looking up where you can't get the esplanade through because it's blocked by these, uh, by these retail buildings, which will now open all the way up and connect to, to the CB3. Um, here you see the tin, historic tin building, which has been badly damaged over the decades, completely restored and opened as a market on the esplanade. The road looking through and making the connection to, to the ships below, to the south. And then the rooftop, which could be used for a multitude of different events. Imagine being at a concert in front of the Brooklyn Bridge. You could see the Statue of Liberty to the south. We really think it'll become a, a kind of iconic home like Bryan Park or Rockefeller Center for Lower Manhattan. So then the next question is, our rule is, don't try to work with developers too much. You'll get in big trouble. You're sleeping with the enemy. You're gonna, it's a slippery slope to hell. It's a really tricky process. It's, you know, your, your ideas will be compromised. And uh, you know, this is the classic, the classic line. Do you want to stand alone against the whole world? There's no place for originality in architecture. <laughs> so, so that's from the Fountainhead. And, um, but you know what? The critical thing is with, with the next thing you need from design is you need to engage in finance, as we talked about. And, and the first time that we were ever able to do that was with a building called the Porter House, where we actually found the site. We negotiated an air rights transfer. We put the deal together. And we, we, we invested in the building to get it built. And uh, some of you may know the building in the Meatpacking District. 
But again, it was this idea of the air rights transfer, cantilevering the building over the historic buildings to the south, getting the cantilever out just far enough in a very cost-effective way that we were able to predict additional revenue so that we could outbid the other people trying to get control of the property. And then to make this new building on top where the idea that it shouldn't be, it, it, its idea of contextuality is that it should look nothing like the building that it's connected to. And so it was about an experimentation of using, of using zinc and a, a, a CNC production of that facade um, where we actually manufactured the curtain wall ourselves. Um, we went to France, we bought 4,000 sheets of zinc, we brought them back to New York, we cut them uh, on a plasma cutter without any shop drawings, and put together, labeled them, the architectural detail of the building itself are the codes that are the instruction set for putting it together. And very quickly the building went together at a very cost effective uh, number and sold out for record prices at the time in that neighborhood. And, you know, it was this kind of connection between the old and new that I think struck a chord with people. The kind of way that we were able to get three exposures on each side, move the core to the center that became our structural element that keeps the building from tipping over. And, and one of my favorite pieces of this is the kind of depth. I think one of the reasons the metal building works so well is that the, the windows are placed 14 inches behind the, the metal facade. Where if we weren't the developer, there's no way we would have gotten to do that. They would have been seen as too much of a waste of space. Um, the other problem with it is by pushing them back, you end up with ledges. That creates a pigeon problem uh, on your building. But we, we actually called the Museum of Natural History. They told us if we made a 33 degree angle, a pigeon will land on it and slide off. Um, and and uh, 12 years after we've gotten this building done, there's not one bird shit on the entire facade. <laughs> the building lights up at night, as really becomes an anchor for what was then not really the meatpacking district as we know it today, um, but it was very different. We did the collateral materials, we brought it to market, and, and here's how the, and wonderfully the building won as many design awards as it won preservation awards. And that to us was really kind of a wonderful thing. But there's this notion of design risk, design reward. And the thing that we learned from that project was that we were, we, you know, literally a lot of the people that we taught with said, you know, this is a really dangerous thing you're doing. You know, you guys have some pretty good street cred. If you guys get in bed with the development community, you know, you might lose that. And, and there was this really interesting thing. You're, you're going to be beholden to them in a way that you couldn't. What we found out was exactly the opposite was true. As soon as we were at risk with our client in the same way, we suddenly had more design freedom than we ever had before. Because they saw the relationship in a completely different way. At the same time, so risk we started to see as a good thing. And when we started to look at things, we, we noticed that, you know, basically the less risk you take, the lower your profit margins are. And the more risk you take, the higher they have to be. One, because you're going to lose every once in a while. That will bring things a little bit back to, to equilibrium. But it's also when you're taking risk and inventing something and doing something that's very successful, you're rewarded for it. And so when you look at different industries, it's pretty interesting to see how low architects' typical profit margin are compared to a lot of other industries. But even within the building industry, it's still pretty low. And it's a lot because of labor costs. It's a lot because of the cost of chasing work. There are a lot of reasons why, why we do it. But one of the main reasons is, as a profession, we don't take risk. The AIA has tried to teach us for the past 40 or 50 years that risk is bad and that you should not get involved in all the other things that help make a building. Keep it, keep it at arm's length and, and you know, that's, the, that's the best strategy. And we're not so sure if that's true. And there is a profitability lag between architecture, engineering, and related services and other professional, scientific, and technical services. And what is that? Why is that? And shouldn't that change? And what do we need to do about it? Another thing is when you're running a firm, when you do your first project of a type, you're sort of steep on the learning curve. This is probably even an aggressive number. You're lucky if you even break even on the first one of a type that you do. But over time, that goes up, and then of course it levels out. But the problem is you don't want to be in one single type of, do one single type of project because all project types go through cycles. 
And if you put all your eggs in one basket, when that, when that industry goes down, you get wiped out. And so the goal is to constantly think about the balance between that profit margin and, and diversifying your work among as many sectors as possible so that you can keep the firm in a healthy place and have more ability to think about what you want to invest in, what you want to do research in to continually push architecture forward. But at the end of the day, what value do you create? What do you really create for your clients? And you know, if you do really create value, are you just a service? Are you something that they could buy anywhere? Or are you something that actually gives them, gives them value and can you, can you actually quantify that value? And if you, if you can, then I think we have to rethink the way in which we work as architects in this industry. Now, I'm, I'm gonna go a little bit into the way deals are structured. And basically, and there's, believe me, for every kind of deal, you know, there's a million different ways to structure a deal. This is a very sort of typical straight up way of thinking about it. But basically, the general partners are the people that find the site, put the deal together, think about it, lead the, lead the, lead the aesthetic and the branding ideas, and do the work all day long. And the limited partners are the people that help them by giving them capital to do that work with. And so what are the metrics on a typical deal? So the way one can think about it is, and these are very broad, round numbers, just to keep it simple. So let's just say you had a 100,000 square foot buildable site. And let's say you, for that land, you have to pay $500 a buildable foot. So that's $50 million to buy the property. Let's say from that, you're going to have about 110,000 square feet of construction because you have basements, you have mechanical spaces. It's a little bit more than what the zoning allows. And let's say you're building that at $400 a square foot. And then your soft costs for running all of that are usually about 30% of those two numbers put together. So that gives you $122 million project cost. Now, what you can get on 122, if you can prove that your, um, that your numbers work and you can show the lender there are co comparable properties in this neighborhood with this typology that were built for this much and sold for this much, and you've got about a 30% uh, projected profit amount, they will loan you about 65% of, the, of the, the amount of the deal. So that's your senior debt, which comes in at your lowest interest rate. And then you go after something called a mezzanine loan because they're second in the payout, so they charge you a little bit more. And you basically need about 20 million in cash to do that project. Now what's typically required, it's not required, it's whatever the developer's reputation can let them get away with, but often they want, to, they want the developer um, himself to put in about 20% of that cash or about $4 million and then that means he needs to raise $16 million from the limited partners and that means the project is completely funded. So that's the cost side. So what happens on the revenue side? You've got about on a 100,000 foot zoning building you end up with about 85,000 square feet net sellable Let's just say, for argument's sake, you sell it at $1,900 a square foot. That's $161 million. Your sales commission to the brokers is going to be about a $1 million. The paying back the senior debt that you've had for that time, plus the interest, is $88 million. And that $8 million additional and those additional interest payments, that's why your clients yell at you to go as fast as possible, because the, the meter is ticking. The mezzanine debt gets paid back, roughly would be about 28 million. The, the, the developer's investment gets paid back with interest. The limited partners get paid back from their um, investment with interest. The developer takes a fee which runs his overhead and is because they are who they are and, can, and have the sort of guts to do this. And the net profit at the end of the day is somewhere around 15,500,000. And that gets split 50-50 between the limited partners and the general partners. So that's basically how a, deal, how a deal works. Now in this whole deal, the architect would have been paid, let's say they were getting $15 a square foot on a 100,000 building, a million and a half dollars, and their cost is probably somewhere around a million two. So for doing almost more work than anyone in this entire project, their net profit is $300,000. Think about that. So the question is, if you think you're good and you believe in the project, why don't you invest your architecture fee of a million and a half dollars up front? 
why don't you say, we'll fund this out of our pocket, but every one of those dollars goes in just the way it goes in as you, as you Mr. Developer, and you, Mr. Uh, limited uh, Partner. And in fact, because we're gonna help you think through this whole project, we're gonna take a piece of the general partnership, and our million and a half is gonna go into the limited side as well. And the developer off, sometimes doesn't like this, but often does like it because their hardest dollar that they have to spend is the money up front before they've got their bank loan in place. And who's the first person they spend money on? The architect. Because they need a drawing and a vision to even go to the bank to get the loan at the first place. So they're thrilled not to have to spend that money up front. So let's just say we invested the million and a half as a, as a, as a profession or as, a, as an architect with these guys. You'd get your million and a half investment back You'd get $240,000 limited partner interest. You'd get $600,000 limited partner distribution. You'd get, if you had 10% of the general partnership, and that would be a reasonable amount for this amount of work, you'd get $775 from the general partner distribution, which means now your fee for that project is about $3.1 million. So you've doubled the fee, and you're going from a 13% profit margin to a 108% profit margin. But now let's talk about sensitivity. Let's say the market turns south. That return goes down and you have a, you, you're at risk, right? But what if you're really good? What if you're the kind of architect that can produce a 15 Central Park West and watch, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and watch the numbers go up, right? But now, now if you really think that what you can do is so good that it's gonna drive sales, it's gonna make it sell out faster, it's gonna sell at higher numbers, watch what happens. If you could just get the number to go up 10%, 10% more in sales would give you another $1.4 million out of the project, which now your profit margin has gone to 201%. There is some data out there, and we've put a lot of these metrics together, that the difference between a very well-known architect who's very, very skilled and a basic building often results in about an average of 17 to 20% additional revenue for the developer. If you go to 20% more in your sales, you're talking about an additional $2.8 million of fee. Suddenly, you're in the 294% profit margin. Suddenly, you can now take that money and, and invest in your firm. You can invest in your people. You can do research. You could do shows. You could do competitions. You can invest in technology. You've got a much better chance for the, for the amount of intelligence that we put into these projects there's no reason why we shouldn't be at risk. Not on all of them. Can't do this on libraries. Can't do this, you know, can't, can't do this on university buildings. But why don't, why don't we as a profession joint venture with these, with these guys and be at risk with them? And you know what? So let's say maybe two out of three work out and one out of three fails. You're still going to be way ahead of the game. And, and I believe that when you do this, you're going to get more design freedom you are gonna to get to be more risky with the ideas that you're testing out, but you're gonna test them out in a really intelligent way that helps you to drive the sales and drive the profitability. And so I've been always sort of saying it's kind of like Newton's third law. The more you go in one direction into the sort of technical and financial and political side of things, you actually get the freedom to go in the exact opposite direction to, to push design ideas and make things happen. Now, in the last 10 years, we've probably done about six deals like this. And four of them went well, one of them went badly, one of them went horribly badly, right? Even if at the end of the day, and I don't even know if this is true, but let's say we broke even. Maybe we did. It was still an amazing idea because we got six projects that we got to test out ideas that helped us win bigger and bigger work over time that allowed us to, that allowed us to sort of experiment and work and work in different ways that we wouldn't have if we didn't take that risk. So on another project that we've been working on is the Domino Sugar Plant project. So really at a critical junction in the river um, where you get amazing views to Midtown and to Lower Manhattan. It's a quarter mile long, 11 acre site. And the original plan that had gone through ULERP had a series of contextually scaled buildings uh, that all ended in cul-de-sacs with stairs down to a park with the buildings facing directly onto the park. And our client came to us and said, tell us we're crazy 
and we should not go through the approvals process a second time. And so we said, well, if, if this were our site, we would probably try and extend the street along the front so that you create a true public park. We would bring the grid of the city through and connect it and really make it part of the fabric of the city, more along the lines of what Riverside Drive is. And then we would take this building out, since you own this site as well, move all the FAR to the other sites, and create a kind of urban public square at this location. And so the idea was, instead of having this sort of wall of lumpy buildings all the same size, let's push them back, let's make them taller, let's put holes in them so that light can get through, <laughs> let's bring the street through, and let's make two kinds of park uh, that one that's sort of more on the urban scale and one on the scale of the river. And let's break the buildings down with different setbacks and public roof terraces, first at the scale of the low-rise industrial neighbors behind, another step at the sort of scale of the Williamsburg Bridge and the Domino Sugar Factory, and a third one as a marker on the skyline. And so we went back to the community, and this does not happen very often, but got almost unanimous approval to increase the height of our buildings by 50%, and, and an extra half a million square feet of FAR because of the design. And they said, and we said, you know, we're showing designs, but these are just zoning diagrams. This is not what the buildings will look like. And they said, well, we want written into the zoning guidelines that they have these giant holes in them <laughs> when they go through, which we did. And so, and of course the holes really, this is just two slab buildings, 65 by you know, 150 foot slabs. The only tricky part is the little bridge, five story bridge that connects, a, connects the two. Otherwise these are super standard buildings, if you will. Same thing on, um, on site four. And so you kind of get you know, a low rise with a building that comes up and the bridge element. Same thing on the high rise. And, and again, these are all placeholder uh, facades because uh, we also said that we would not take this project if shop were to design all five of them. We didn't want to be in a place that was all shop. Uh, we are going to take this one which because it's first, and we're going to take this one because we think it's the coolest. But um, <laughs> this one and this one and this one are all going to go to other architects. And we're very excited about this. And James Corner is doing all of our landscape from field ops. And again, it's remarkable, much more open space. Um, Jim's doing an amazing job on, on the park where we're actually taking the refinery elements out. Um, here you can see the building. It's a much more mixed use development. Um, no big box stores whatsoever designed specifically that they can't be accommodated. Um, no poor door. Some of you have been reading about the poor doors that are happening lately. So we just don't believe in that. We don't think it's right. And then also some of the zoning on the Williamsburg waterfront and the Long Island City waterfront, it's got the same height all along, like 350 feet. I don't understand why that, people think that makes a good city, that everything is the same height. Because, you know, um, uh, as, as many of us refer to looking at the skyline of New York as the same excitement when Dorothy saw Oz for the first time, it's about that difference. Imagine if we had that ridiculous kind of zoning cap. That's what New York would look like. <laughs> Right? That's miserable. We don't want that. So the idea is instead of a monotonous wall, let's get a sort of new waterfront skyline and, and get those buildings through. And, and it, passed, it passed and it's uh, under construction right now. Another, another rule is don't be nice. This idea that there's an important social responsibility required in architecture. And that it isn't about the individual in the cubicle working like a machine producing drawing sets. There are some very well-known architects who use this formula to get around labor laws in the United States, where you get paid an annual salary of $16,000 or $17,000 a year because they can make an argument that that equates uh, to being paid minimum wage. And we don't believe that. We think that that's, that's a terrible idea, that it's really about how you treat your people that matters. Um, we've never had an unpaid intern in the history of our office, not even day one when, when it was the five of us with no money. Every single employee has to have full health insurance, mostly paid by us. Every designer has access to the partners. We will not work for dictators. 
We will not work in, in countries where indentured servitude is used to build the buildings. We just think that's fundamentally wrong and not what we should be doing as a profession. And whenever we go to another country, we try to do, set up as much knowledge transfer as possible. So we worked for another company that says they don't do evil and um, worked on a very interesting project with them where they wanted a building that was beyond lead platinum was the, was the assignment for a 350,000 foot uh, a technology building. And so it was this idea of a kind of um, uh, roof that held all the technology and then there were gardens that were sunk into it. Um, and we wrote our own software, the, our own scripts that showed the founders that if they changed the priorities of what the building was going to do, it literally changed the morphology of the building itself. And it was about neighborhoods and the way in which one would occupy their spaces to sort of get their, uh, their, their engineers talking and thinking with each other. And so we thought about the building on scales, different scales like the superhighway, how you move from different departments to the sort of main street where there were smaller elements down to the kind of medieval streets where, uh, where different groups were working on separate softwares. It generated this form. Here was the model of the building. And uh, it was, we were very excited to get started. And then the global financial crisis hit. Um, and they put the building on hold. I mentioned to them that I had read that they had 17 billion in cash on their balance sheet, but <laughs> that didn't, uh, they didn't want to be seen building a building like that at that time, so it went on hold. So now we had a bunch of people with not a lot to do as the crisis hit. So there was an international competition to do an innovation hub in Botswana, Africa. And so we took, um, <laughs> we took, we took Google and we, where the sun is in the south, and we flipped it to Botswana, <laughs> Africa, where the sun was in the north, and took the same idea and took the different climate conditions and the different programmatic relationships that were needed for an innovation hub. And so we took this idea of the dune and delta, the two uh, sort of major landform uh, elements in Botswana, and made a uh, a, a similar kind of building with a series of bars that could be phased over time that were connected. But one of the wonderful things were there were these incredible 150-year-old trees all over the site that they told us we could clear. But we said instead, just build the parking. The parking needs to be shaded in, in, in Botswana because the sun's too hot. So we said, we'll just burn the property up. We'll put the parking on grade. The new sort of first floor of the building will be burned up a, a floor and we'll cut holes and let the trees come up through, through from the parking to create the parking below to create these shading areas inside these uh, uh, courtyards. And so we won the competition um, and have gone down and set up education programs in the architecture school, have been going back and forth and the project is under construction right now, should be finished in about 14 months, 15 months yeah. from now. Um, incredible uh, 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 scripting for parametric design for the roof systems. This will be the largest green roof in Africa, even though it'll be brown 10 months out of the year. Um, we took traditional uh, uh, local basket weaving techniques and wrote scripts to develop different kinds of wall systems for the public spaces. Um, they're making it out of harvested wood uh, down there. They've got the CNC machines in Gaborone making the pieces. Um, so these become the kind of in the double and triple height spaces, the way that the surfaces get done. These were the prototypes of the wood wall elements. And then what these will look like, they'll have the mechanical and ventilation and lighting systems behind them. And we'll create these interior spaces. Whoops, sorry. Here are the, the more recent uh, uh, images. And the entry, the roof and the building as it will sit in the landscape. So it's been an amazing experience to work, to work on, this, uh, at, on this project. Rule five, don't talk about beauty. So you know, this idea about, um, about design and theory and talking about beauty you know, is, tri is tricky, right? Because we're taught not to really talk about it. But humans need beauty as much as we need air, water, song, particularly when it is understood as the fingerprint of human action 
in the anonymous vastness of our times. And I think I'm going to skip through PS1. You guys have all seen it. I don't want to make sure we get there fast. But um, we're currently working on a project that we can't tell you what country or city it's in or who the, who the client is. But it's, it's a really interesting project because it's, it's three institutions and a Kunsthal coming together with a financial driver of a development building on top. And not one of the, con not any one of the four main elements can have the primary uh, spot. They all have to be equal. And so the idea was to take four sort of silos of arts institutions, twist them around each other, cut them according to the, to the box of the site, and then find a place that you might be able to go up in the future um, with a tower. And to think about the street level uh, with different kinds of uh, elements, music and market, shopping, and then uh, sort of big social gathering space, and then how the building has a giant sort of public urban living room facing one of the main corners of the city with an operable window that opens up and, and can open and close depending on the weather with a large amphitheater facing this public space. And as the space moves up, each one, each one of the institutions has its own zone and you can go in glass bridges a la Grand Central Station between those elements and then wherever the markers for the, the sort of campus uh, lines of desire on the ground floor become the slots between the different institutions to mark uh, the entries on the facade. And uh, this was the hardest model we ever built. Um, you could see it going together. Um, and then this is the proposed uh, project which won the competition and that we're working on right now. Um, but you can really see uh, the, into these kind of uh, uh, incredible section spaces between the institutions and then the grand urban room and then the entry and the base to what will eventually be a tower on top. Um, this is basically a, a kind of ceramic rain screen uh, with glass. This whole part has multiple theaters on this section so the theaters actually occupy um, the sloping uh, uh, floor and uh, some looks inside the building. These are, of course, very early renderings. But um, really an exciting project to take so many of the things that we've done and now address them to a cultural institution and to really just try and think about a building that's both beautiful and functional at the same time. Don't get involved in means and methods. Two more projects and we're done. Um, literally every contract tells you not to get involved in means and methods. And yet, I think from day one, we've always felt that if you're going to get these buildings built, if you're going to take risks and try and push the envelope of what you could do, you better damn well know how that building goes together or it's going to get VE'd out as soon as possible. And so from the day one, we've always really tried to think, before we make a shape or a form, how is that going to be made? What's the material? How is it going to be put together? How do you clamp it? What's the expensive way of putting it together? And what's the less expensive way? And if the less expensive way we can make just as beautiful, go with that right away, we'll have a better chance of getting it done. And you know, that's technology. You know, that's really getting involved in that. And it's the use of technology to celebrate humanity, not the use of technology to celebrate technology. That's a big critical difference. And the time where I think, I mean, I think we've been doing this since PS1, but the time we got to execute it on the biggest scale was at Barclays Center. Um, where there, if we did not actually joint venture with the facade manufacturer and the contractor, there's no way we get that facade built. And as some of you know, this was a long process that started with, with Frank Geary and his brilliant plan for an urban arena that was surrounded by four towers that had basically big foundations that held a bowl in the middle. Now, when the economy went south, they all said the arena was too expensive. The arena was not too expensive. The arena was a billion dollars to begin with and it was a billion dollars when it got finished. What was the problem was that in 2009, you could not finance any of the four towers that were holding up the arena. They, there, there was no one was giving loans on them. So they had to redesign the whole building, which Bruce Ratner loved Frank and loves all the work that he's done with them and it's a really smart idea for an urban arena. The problem was if the foundations weren't in the ground, 
by December 31st, 2009, that was when tax, uh, stadium tax bond, stadium bond financing was no longer tax deductible. And that would have been a $400 million hit to the project. So they had to redesign the project and get it in the ground. This was now May of 2009. So they went to the biggest design build contractor of NBA arenas, uh, uh, which was Hunt Construction. They said, how do we get in the ground in seven months? They said, you have to go to an arena that we've already built, see that it fits on the site. We have the steel drawings already done. We can order the steel tomorrow and maybe we can get you in. So that's what they did. And they picked an Ellerbe Beckett building from Indianapolis. It fit on the site. And it was really unfair to Ellerbe Beckett because they were told to just do that. It caused a few problems in the city of New York when everyone felt they were going to get a Frank Geary building and instead they didn't. Um, and then they asked us to come in and see if we could take, take the existing steel, take it apart as much as we could, and then rebuild it again and completely change what the building would look like, which was not easy. And oh, they gave us seven weeks to do that, um, <laughs> including designing it, detailing it, and costing it. And we had a delta of 40 million max or we were fired. So what we said was that we had to think about this building as it related to people walking on the street because we wanted it to be a good neighbor. We wanted to have one band of the building that related to the sort of brownstone height in, in Brooklyn, and then another sort of element or band above that was something that could be read on the skyline. And so this was the idea would take it from a horizontal building to, I'm sorry, from a vertical building to a horizontal building, um, align the sidewalk with the concourses so there was constantly views in and out, and then make this sort of grand civic gesture, um, as we've sort of uh, jokingly called it, the arms of Bernini, but hip hop style for Brooklyn. <laughs> so, um, and then the other thing is that there was not one parking spot built for this arena, not one. And so we said that this should be the first arena, certainly in the United States, that prioritizes those who come by public transportation over those who come by private transportation. And so we worked on this subway station that when you come up out of it, you look up through this oculus of the sort of arms of Bernini, if you will, at the upper halo, and then opened up the building and took away a huge amount of the seating so that when you first come in, you can see all the way to the bowl and to the scoreboard. We had to model this entire building. It was 12,000 different shaped panels of core 10 steel. We produced all the fabrication tickets. We helped them set up a factory to weather the steel. They went through 15 wet dry cycles a day for four months to put 10 years of patina on them. We tagged every single one and wrote, wrote the codes for them. We wrote an iPhone software app that you could go up and scan any panel at any time so that everyone from Bruce Ratner to a guy with a wrench had the same exact information and knew exactly how the building was going together at that time. And that transparency is what changed everything on the pricing of the building. They were made into 921 mega panels, delivered to the site, and they all fit. You can see the building as it sits today. And then we got them to put the digital boards on the inside ring of the Oculus so it wouldn't blare out into the neighborhood and really creates this incredible sort of public space as you come to the building. And the interiors were the idea of the kind of wet Brooklyn night I know this is driving you crazy, Bob, talking about Brooklyn so much, right? <laughs> so Better you than me. <laughs> um, the, ribs, the ribs come in from the outside that hold up the, the facade and create these uh, lighting elements. There are sort of these minimalist boxes that pop in with all Brooklyn um, uh, uh, food vendors, um, some places where the materials change to get warmer. Um, we went back to PS1 for the, for the bar carts, the beer carts, which was really fun to do. And um, we not only convinced them to make all, this, all the seats black, because we felt it wanted to be like black box theater, that sports, sports are this, is this great uh, entertainment that has an unscripted ending. And so we wanted it to be more dramatic, more theatrical, and, um, and help convince the team to change their colors from red, white, and blue to black and white. Um, my dumbest uh, business career move of my life was not figuring out a way to profit from that because they went from 26th in sales in the league to 5th in sales in the league in one year, probably worth 50 to $60 million. And finally, the last project and the last rule, don't try to do it all. 
And you know, what we try to do is think about, is think about, we have a lot of smart, creative people in the office. What are the other things we can do? What are the problems that architects are facing all the time? What should we test out? And so we've just currently developed, we're developing this software. We're actually in our venture capital fundraising right now. It's all been funded in-house, but now we're gonna bring it commercially. And this is an example of a software, let me click that, that uh, we've developed called Envelopes. This is a little animation. And what you can do is you can look up any site, you can select the site, it will give you all the zoning information, it will tell you what you can do, you click on these buttons, it tells you all the bonuses that you can have, all the rules, and within 60 seconds, we'll master building for you. <laughs> and it not only outputs it to your, to your spreadsheet for your financial analysis, it also outputs it to Revit so you can start designing. You can, you can click through and change the floor to floor heights. You watch the building literally morph in the zoning code. And if you make a decision that leaves any square feet on the table, uh, it will let you know and let your client know as well. So it's an amazing thing. That's something that takes a good architect and a, and a zoning uh, lawyer you know, six hours to do uh, at, extreme, you know, at extremely high rates. This is now a product that can do it for you online in under 60 seconds. And we think it's something that not only will help architects and, and zoning attorneys and developers, but we actually think in the same way that Lotus 1, 2, 3 and Excel, when spreadsheets came out in the 80s, that's when mergers and acquisitions went up on Wall Street. Because suddenly people could look at information in a completely different way, understand sensitivity analysis, and therefore were more willing to make the deals. We believe software like this will actually make all of us get more commissions in the future. So again, what we really believe is that the, the parts of this model are what come back together to, to, to create architecture. And that it's doing all of those elements and, and getting your, your hands dirty in all the different parts to really make it come together. And so the last building that I'm gonna show you is our project on 57th Street. Um, you know, again, this idea of the sort of low New York fabric and then the soaring tower was an inspiration to us. And we thought about what are the buildings that New Yorkers love the most? Um, and why do we love them? And I think one of the reasons we love them is their proportion. And that they, they have, these were all office buildings, obviously, but they have this incredible proportion, this detail of the setback, and this kind of rich use of material that plays with shadow and light. And that these slender towers are, are just, they look good. Um, and they, they used to sit above the low rise of, of the city itself. But of course, with air conditioning and different kinds of corporate structures, the bigger floor plate became the more desirable floor plate, and the buildings became much more massive, and suddenly sat on the skyline like this. But as I said before, I think we're in a remarkable time, because now the cost of some of these prime residential spaces has gone up so much that it actually makes it um, uh, uh, possible to build super tall for residential. And so now you've got a series of six or seven super tall buildings going up mostly along the 57th Street corridor that are going to almost bring back that golden age of the New York skyscraper. And, and they range in sizes and, so, and ours is actually the, the, the skinniest of all of them at only 60 by 80 feet. Um, uh, 432 Park is 80 by 80 or 80 by 90. Um, and then the, the site that we had was Steinway Hall. Uh, our client actually had the interior landmark. It's a Warren and Wetmore building um, and home to Steinway Piano since the 1920s. And the way, that we, the way that we got this approved, because the only other, and I think this right, the only other tower that's been put on a landmark building is Hearst. Is that correct? A super tall tower? Um, yes, yeah, pretty much. I think it's the only one. So um, well, we're doing one on 60th that cantilevers over. Cantilevers, over. but it doesn't actually sit. On no. It. Right. So that's right. Right. So the as of right scheme actually allowed us to build the building right up against the landmark and kind of obliterate the whole side. And so what we argued to landmarks was let us push it back. We'll fulfill the 85 foot high street wall requirement with, with a retail base but let us celebrate the beautiful part of the building, but
but we're going to have to build a little bit on top of the building back in, in, uh, in sort of the corner. And then in order to get the first apartment to have the views over the buildings of, uh, to the north of it onto the park, this will literally be built as a 21-story atrium with nothing in it to push all of the FAR up above. And so here you can see uh, the kind of base and how it integrates with the historic building. This whole wall, uh, there used to be a uh, two-story, the Ritz Thrift Shop used to be there. So there, all that limestone was gone, so we're going to restore that wall as if it was always exposed. You'll be able to see it from the side. And, um, and then you've got the plan with the historic building here. We're using the old loading docks for the Steinway pianos into a new port cochere. And Bob, you can write it down now. I never thought I'd draw an ellipse in a plan in my entire life. And, and if there was I never thought I'd get you to do one. <laughs> <laughs> and if there ever was a slippery slope to hell, I think I just went down. <laughs> it's going to be the making of you. <laughs> Um, and so then you, you really now see the landmark as it turns. The, the bronze facade comes down and drops as this kind of minimalist retail facade. And then we looked at the idea of the setback, the famous Hugh Ferris drawings. And we said, OK, this is our zoning envelope. This would be the way the setback would normally be done. But what if we hyper-articulated the setback and did a, almost what we call the feathered setback? Um, and what if we thought about the plan, because it's dead center on the park, where you kind of have the park view and the city view as you come off the elevator. We thought of it as the sort of living to the north and the sleeping to the south, and uh, the plans. And structurally, the building is basically two monster shear walls on the east and west, where you have the least amount of view. They are punctured a little bit for some of your service rooms. But really, it's almost solid on both sides. And that's the way we're getting it to stand up. So we said, how would we articulate that facade? And again, went back to what are our favorite buildings in New York from a certain period. And we said, well, what if we use traditional materials but in a super contemporary way? And what if we made each single setback a plaster in and of itself, and then took the pattern from the setback and took the material, which is going to be terracotta and bronze, and made 21 different shapes of the terracotta so that it twists back and forth as you go up the facade so that when the light comes from the south, it'll cast these shadows in the thickness of the facade itself. And so here, who knew we could use a French curve? So here's a French <laughs> curve, and here are the different 21 layers. And then as they move up and down, they create these uh, shadows on the facade itself. You can see and the models. These are the full-scale mock-ups. The, the terracotta cantilevers, 21 inches off the facade. So it will be legible um, as you go up. And then it's got a bronze filigree that's sort of a sinewy tissue pulling apart the elements that then have both the sheer wall and the, the glass windows behind them on the east and west facades. And looking east on 57th Street, you'll get this kind of incredible uh, uh, reading of the materiality and the, the idea of the New York building, but very much a 21st century version of it. Um, the park view is almost all glass with, uh, again, a bronze reveal. Uh, the windows get wider towards the middle and narrower out towards the end. So that's really your 60-foot living space facing the park, dead center. And the city view has vertical uh, bronze fins running up and down the building, and then creates the sort of setback terraces as you go up. And yes, Sophia Loren has bought an apartment. So. Um, the building is uh, 1,400 feet tall and 60 feet by 80 feet wide, which will make it the most slender building in the world uh, at 24 and a half to 1 slenderness ratio. And then at night, uh, the last apartment is about here. Then you have the tune mass damper. And then really, the top 200 feet is just a glass and bronze uh, sculpture, or nightlight, if you will, um, on the sky skyline. And working with L'Observatoire, um, inside the terracotta are soft lights that will reflect off the bronze itself. So in the day, you'll really read the terracotta. And at night, you'll read the bronze.
and the building sitting uh, on 57th Street. So those are the seven rules. Um, it's been really fun to think about them. It's been fun to, um, you know, to, to think about architecture and some of the things that really matter to our firm and to talk to you about it tonight. I mean, I think this is an incredible, incredible time to be a young architect. Um, you know, the technology is making complexity apparent and allowing us to challenge the status quo at every turn. There's paradigm shifts that are allowing us to think as architects and operate in different ways that maybe we never had had the ability to do before. I've said this before, I think that architecture is the last great generalist profession. That what we're so good at is that we're so good at many, many things. But yet somehow I think as a profession we've lost our way and we've tried to think narrowly in just terms of aesthetics and have given up on the politics or the finance or the technology or all the things that made us master builders. You know, throughout the 20th century, most schools of architecture enforced the notion that collaboration was a path towards mediocrity and was therefore the sole concern of multi-headed corporate firms. But with the advent of a new millennium, a younger generation of practitioners and educators are intensely experimenting with new modes of collaboration. And these new modes of collaboration embody the complexity of the problems we are trying to solve today. By acting upon the ferocity of our convictions, we seek to recast the role of architects as, as we who reveal the coherence in our chaos, we who through our collective imprint expose the lurking beauty in the bedlam of our world. I am proud to be an architect. I believe we can make a huge difference. And we ha but we have to prove that Newton was correct and have equal and opposite reactions. We need to be both and. We need to take the risks. We need to take the chance. We need to break the rules. And I think we can have an incredible time with our lives doing it and make the world a better place. Thank you very much. Thank you, Greg. Shop the method. Shop the um, the the the, um, the 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 product. Uh, that was just great. Uh, I'm sure there are a few questions. Will you take them? I'm happy to take some questions. Questions for Greg Pascarelli. Uh, Brendan Buck, can we get a mic to you? We have one here first. Is it working? <laughs> Sorry, I I didn't see you. Sorry. Uh, so in, in all of the developers de lectures year after year, I've never heard them talk about money. And so it was great to see, hear about the back end and make that explicit. Um, Thomas Piketty's Capital of the 21st Century is sort of about capital becoming more valuable than labor. And so the clever thing that you're doing there is turning labor, in a sense, into capital. And, and um, I guess the, the question would be, as architects, that seems good for us. We're also trained to be not just a service profession, but also you know civic duty, challenge the public, our the inhabitants of our buildings. When architects have that much of a profit margin, is there any concerns we should have about architecture and the sort of outcome, design-wise, civic-wise, et cetera? Um, no, no, I actually think the opposite. If we're not struggling and killing ourselves to pay the rent every single month, you would actually might spend more time designing. I mean, it's, you know, and I think that, um, look, you know, th that was a complete, th those metrics that I showed were a complete hypothetical example. And for every win that you have, you have loss, you, there are losses as well. So at the end of the day, it's never gonna be a 200% profit margin. You're gonna have some losses that bring you back. But let's not operate at 13% anymore. I mean, that's ridiculous for what we contribute. But it's all we deserve because we don't take the risk. So all I'm and again, also when you're doing, you know, well maybe at a presidential library you get a bigger fee, but in like regular libraries or regular, <laughs> regular buildings. Maybe on other jobs too. <laughs> you know, you, um, you're not, you know, when you're doing a, a, a park, you're not going to take, you're not going to get a piece of the action of the park, right? So even if this is 10 or 20 percent of the work that you're doing, and if you can do well on two out of three, you know, it's not going to make you suddenly 
making the same amount of money as you know uh, Larry Silverstein or Steve Ross. It's it's what we're just saying is take the risk and then use that capital to help you do a better job, to to make a better culture in your office, to experiment with all more forms, to think about uh, the impact that you have, as opposed to that sort of daily brutal struggle, which quite frankly it is, the practice of architecture is. But it's self-made. We have that question in the back. Hi. Oh. Um, you talked about the ferocity of your convictions. I, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. You talked about the ferocity of your convictions. I'm interested to know, when did they form? And what's the background? Did you always have them, or when on did they the come back? North on the way up here today. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, you know, qu quite frankly, um, I think that's what brought the five of us together. Um, you know, along with my partners, uh, Bill and Chris and Corey and Kim, um, that we. That was how the conversation started. We didn't join each other because we all had a sort of similar hand or aesthetic idea. We, we had a, a conviction that the, the practice could be better. And then joined by our other partners and our incredible staff, I think people are attracted to us who want to have those questions. So it was there from day one. It was there from the first day I walked into architecture school that I, I just wanted to know why the city was the way it was. And I think we all felt that way and wanted to learn more about how to have an impact on it. So it was, it was day one. I didn't know what I was talking about, but I, it was day one. I probably still don't. No, you do a good job. <laughs> uh, no, Avi, you're an editor. You can't. Jo Joel, you had your time to talk to him. <laughs> After hearing uh, tonight's exquisitely crafted lecture, I forgive you for canceling our meeting yesterday. <laughs> I, I was told first thing at 9 o'clock in the morning, Meeting's canceled, and then I heard from a reliable source, Greg's in a panic, he's working on his lecture. That is correct. Yes. <laughs> and so clearly... You, you know why? Because I set, a, I set aside two weeks in August to work on it, and so I got to it yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but clearly it shows, and I think one thing that I think impresses is that it seems very perfectly calibrated to talk to this audience that, that you know of students and peers. And so I guess my question is, would you give this same lecture to some of the other constituencies, the politicians, the, uh, the fabricators, the developers. I mean, one of the takeaways is that we have to be nimble and talk. How do you craft and alter this lecture to speak to it's these a good question. Groups? I mean, I don't really get the chance to lecture to, you know, government officials that often. But uh, many of the, I mean, if you want to say that when you're doing a community board meeting or something, when you're trying to convince a community to do a building, these are the same images. They might be in slightly, and the same diagrams, they might be in slightly different order, and the, 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 the inside baseball information might be removed. But in general, we're talking about trying to make cities better, and we're trying to talk about what the risks are and what we think can improve it, and what they might have to trade for one thing or another, and why we think that the trades we're proposing for them are good. And we might say that to a fabricator, and we might say that to a client, it wouldn't be exactly the way it's phrased here for an architecture audience. And I think that's a problem that architects often have, is that they forget how to talk to a general population or to a specific other population. We're so busy talking to each other. And it's, uh, it's important to, you know, to, to, to learn how to speak to many different groups. So I'd say 80% of the information is the same, and 20% is crafted a little bit differently. That's a good question. I'm reminded of. Something that Jack Roberts in the architect, whom you know, and many in the audience do, I hope, he told me a very long time ago when he left practice in the, and worked for the city, and then he went to work for a developer. And he said he learned one thing at the developers' meetings. At the table, all the people at the table, the lawyers, the, everybody were arguing for more money, and the architect was arguing for a lower fee right. constantly. <laughs> Now, he was speaking tongue-in-cheek, but it is true that, oh, I'll be so happy to do this project, Mr. Developer, right. or whatever. Uh, architects have had a very bad sense of what their value is, and they think it's not that if you get paid in a capitalist society, you're compromising yourself. And, and I, I'll make an argument it's exactly the opposite. Absolutely. And we should, and you know what, we, we all have such 
respect for the academy. We have such respect for theory. We have such respect for institutions like this. And, and it's very, very important. But I also think for these institutions to thrive, we have to have these conversations as well. It shouldn't be all about money the way, or 80% about money the way it is in, in practice sometimes. But, but why not talk about this on day one and think about how we can all do this better? It's good for all of us. Maybe one more question if there is one. If not, I think we will um, do what good, hard-earning, high-earning architects do. <laughs> Drink. Drink. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope Great that